za začetek bomo tale obvodni del, kar v slovenskem jeziku, potem pa nadaljujemo do bodek v angliščini. Veseli smo, da so smo se zbrali v tako velikem številu že v prvem delovnem tednu, novega leta. Upamo, da to nakazuje na to, da bo leto bogato z dogodki s sedinami in druženi. Najbolj na tem mestu še vsebno v imenu alumni ekonomske fakultete želim, da bo leto 2020 zaznamovano z napredki na vseh področjih. Dekarja ekonomske fakultete je trenutno na žalost zadržana, se nam pridruži v prihodnjih minutah. Z veseljem pa babim na odr predsednika alumni ekonomske fakultete, gospoda Jane Zaškravca, da z vami deli nekaj obodnih misli ob tem letu. Kaj lahko jaz še dodamo v tako lepem uvodu, tako lepe sodelo, ker pa naj to priču neko rekel. Pa je, Hvala Bogu, ki so tudi zelo dobro. Ampak, res, jaz sem tudi, jaz sem prvi, če sem zelo ponosen, ker sem predsednik alumni kluba, ekonomske fakultete. Veseli se uspehov tako fakultete, profesorov kot vas na vaših delovnih mestih. Zelo sem ponosen, ker med nami dano razmestimo tako oglednega profesorja s tako oglednim moderatorom, kot je gospod Šefančič, Dan, gospod Danovič. In jaz bi še srečo nove to vsem vam, upam, da smo še večkrat srečovali letos. Imamo zelo veliko aktivnosti, Monika je tisti novi, ta driver, motor tega našega društva, organizacije. In veselim se vseh novih srečan. Danes pa seveda upam, da bomo tudi v kakšnih pametnih zaključev prišli. Hvala. Predvsem je pa zaslužen za vsebino današnjega dogodka. Jože, hvala za sodelovanje. In pa na tem mestu hvala tudi za podporo in da so vso omogočili današnji dogodek v podjetju Grand Forum v Slovenija. Jože, ti pa že kar predajam besedo. Hvala, Maša. Dobro večer, lepo pozdravljeni. Hvala, ker ste se tako velikem naštivilo prezrešili tega dogodka. Včas veliko dobrost pa mi je danes, da v Ljubljani, na ekonomski kvaliteti, spet pustimo gospoda Branka Milanoviča. Gospod Milanovič je bil naš gost v leti leta nazaj, leta in pol nazaj, ko je predstavljal svojo prejšnjo knjigo o Global Inequality. Ta nova knjiga, katero danes predstavlja, se pravi Capitalism alone, da je samo kapitalizem, je v bistvu nekako logično nadevanje tega, kar se v svetu dogaja. Milanoviča verjetno sami toliko dobro poznate, ker je pač postala velika svetovna zvezda na tem področju, ampak seveda je treba vedeti, da je pot do te zvezde bila kar dolga. Milanovič je en izmed pionir riskovanja na področju ekonomske neenakosti, z tega področja je naredno potra, seveda in kasneje se je zaposlil na Svetovni banki, kjer je na veliko zbiro podatke o uporabi gospodinstva in tako naprej, iz katerih je bilo mogoče do tega vse države, ki jih je potrila Slovna banka, izračunati, kakšna je neenakost v posamežnem državi in seveda, kakšna je globalna neenakost. Na podlagi tega svojega znanja in pa seveda poskopa do tega velike količine podatkov in lahko seveda izdal svoje štribine knjige, da je tudi zelo štiri knjige z tega področja in je postal svetovna autoriteta. Seveda, ki Manoveč je zaslovel potem, boče zelo nehote, z svojim članom skupaj z Vaknerjem, z Elephant Curve, ki ste verjetno vsi videli. Ta krivulja je seveda po moje krivulja desetletja, ki prikazuje v bistvu, kaj se je zgodilo v času globalizacije v dveh desetletjih, kako so se poradili koristi v času najbolj intenzivne globalizacije v svetovnem merilu in pokaže seveda jasne vinarje pa jasne luzrije. Kasneje so kolege Piketty in ostali tole krivuljo Elephant Curve še, tako da rečem, temu bezificirali na njihovih podatkih in so prišli nekako v podobno obliko, ampak z podaljšanim trupom, ko so v bistvu imenovali Loch Ness. 
njene nekaj pokaži, da je v bistvu ta porazdelitev koristne globalizacije, da je še bistveno bolj skljiv, bistveno bolj nagljena v stran tistih globalnega enega procenta ali pa nič seveda nič 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 enega procenta v svetu. Sveda, vse te stvari je omogočil gospod Gdanovič, ki bo danes potem predstavil to novo knjigo o kapitalizmu, ko veste, je zatvarjena tezva te knjige predvsem to, da danes nimamo neke konkurence več med različnimi socioekonomskimi sistemi, ampak nam je ostal samo še kapitalizem in različne varijante kapitalizmu. In seveda tudi znotraj tega se pa vse pojada potem neka konkurenca med temi različnimi vrstami kapitalizma in vprašanje na koncu, katera je na teh vrst kapitalizma bo prevladala, bolj liberalna, manj liberalna, bolj politična in katero sve nemo šli. Najbrž mi nekaj gospod Imanoš vsega tega odgovoril že tako na čisto svojem predavanju, zadaj tega je tudi kasneje seveda s tem namenjena tudi kasnejša diskusija, ki je obskušala da se malo se zadatno se niko dobira. Tako da bom predlog, gospod Imanoš, to je zdaj. in Slovene, so actually follow them. <laughs> uh, well, first, thank you very much for coming, as, as actually, as Joje said, and it actually is, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Stefan said, uh, uh, mentioned as well, in, in such large numbers, because it is obviously late in the day, it's also late in the week, and uh, I'm sure people have all other, you know, things to do, so I really appreciate your coming in very large numbers here. I, I also have to say this is my first presentation of the book in this year, actually. So this is my, uh, you know, the beginning of the, uh, 2020 in Ljubljana. So I'm very, actually, pleased with that. Uh, let me uh, start the presentation first by sim simply telling you what is, uh, you know, you already said already a little bit what the book is about, and actually you said more what is uh, in the global inequality. Uh, but let me actually explain a little bit what is in the book, because I will not be able to cover, and you will see why, because they're really very heterogeneous topics, so I will not be able to cover all of them, and I'll focus on only one of them. The first uh, chapter uh, is called The Contours of the Post-Cold War, uh, and essentially addresses two big changes which I think have happened. One is that capitalism is now the only mode of production in the world. Of course, I know that immediately people will think of China. I argue in the book, and I can show you some, and maybe during the discussion we will talk about that more, actually in terms of any objective criteria, like the employment in the private sector, contribution of the private sector value added in the total GDP, and everything else, China is indeed a capitalist country. Uh, one should not be misled by the fact that uh, the party is called Communist Party, because you have parties which are called many different names, and they can actually obviously evolve and keep the, the, the name which may not have any reality, will be any connection with actual reality. Uh, and the second change is that there was a rebalancing of the world that's actually a little bit also from my previous book. It is really the rise of Asia, and the rise of Asia implies a reduction of global inequality because <coughs> many people who have been relatively poor and quite poor have now rejoined something that you can call the global middle class. Again, China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on are prime examples. So basically, these are the two big themes of the book. And that's why the book is called Capitalism Alone, because capitalism is the only mode of production that currently exists. Now, uh, chapter two deals with liberal or meritocratic capitalism, that the term of course, in this case, applies essentially to the Western countries, including, of course, countries like Slovenia, but I, I use the U.S. because of the size and because of the number of data that I have. I use the United States as the prime example of that system. I have to say very briefly that these terms are not kind of made-up terms. I didn't invent them. I took the terms of liberal and meritocratic from Rawls's uh, theory of justice, when he talks about different types of, it, of equalities. Liberal equality, in, uh, meritocratic first, is simply the fact that there is no impediment to individuals achieving given position in life because of their background. So in other words, you don't have a caste system, you don't have a system where only nobility can be nobles or clergy. 
So meritocracy doesn't mean in what is in popular jargon used as something that is deserved. So meritocracy simply means there, there is a legal equality of individual before the law uh, in roles. <coughs> and liberal means that the system corrects for two inequalities which are sort of inherited. One is it taxes inheritance heavily, and, or at least the uh, roles wanted them to be taxed heavily, so that uh, the advantages are not uh, uh, conveyed over generations. <coughs> Excuse me. And secondly, it, uh, it uh, has uh, a free public education. The next topic uh, and, uh, in chapter 3 is political capitalism of China. The term of political capitalism comes from Max Weber. Many of you might recognize it. It was really introduced quite a few years ago. And of course, it's the essential the idea that it's a capitalistic system, but the state plays a role, which is quite important. And finally, the two last chapters, I will not speak about them, what, what is the interaction of globalization and, and capitalism. I think there are some interesting topics there because that's one of the topics there is the issue of migration. I have a proposal which was already present in global inequality and actually many of the invitations that I get, especially from Germany, Austria, so one really are motivated by that idea of uh, not having uh, uh, any more like binary category of citizenship, like being citizen or not being citizen, by introducing something in between. I discussed another topic which I think would be interesting for people to read. I discussed corruption. I think that we really have to take corruption as really an integral part of the globalized capitalism. We, I don't think, should really close our eyes to the massive spread of corruption in uh, all countries and in, in practically in all parts of, of our activity. And then the last one is a, a chapter about like a, of our ordinary life under you know commercialized or what they call hyper commercialized uh, globalization, uh, which deals with issues like a gig economy, commodification of ordinary like leisure time, the use uh, commodification of our apartments through Airbnb, commodification of our cars through uh, Uber and other Lyft and other you know inventions, which I think is an important phenomenon because for the first time we have now something which was a personal property. If you, some of you might actually remember Marx, personal property is different from private property. Personal property is something that I use for personal you know, enjoyment, but, but it becomes capital only when of course I use it to, to make money. <coughs> and actually our apartments have now become actually, uh, they have become really capital and that's actually a big thing. Uh, evolution and our leisure time has also to some extent become commodified because we can make money by essentially going on the internet doing things and uh, that was something that really in the past obviously did not exist. Anyway, these are the topics I just wanted to mention. I will not speak of them, but I will uh, actually focus on chapter two, which really deals with capitalism and I think probably during the, the, the discussion that we will have, probably we will talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the role of China. So, the two things I mentioned here, that is, uh, what, are, uh, what are not covered in this talk, is also uh, a topic about the global historical role of communism. And I think it's a very interesting topic, but we don't have enough time to discuss that. And uh, the, the, the second part, which I already mentioned, is the domination of capitalism, uh, which is sort of made possibly and reinforced uh, by the system of values that I think we share, which essentially is a system of values that puts uh, the acquisition of wealth at the really top of, uh, of, uh, you know, of our uh, sort of desires and of the way that we perceive the world. So that goes back to Adam Smith, it goes back to, to uh, Mandeville, you know, as you can see here, it was private vices and public virtue. So these are some of the old things which are now being sort of uh, presented differently. So uh, after all of this uh, sort of introduction, let me uh, say something about first you know, to try to, to understand different types of capitalism. <coughs> uh, the, the essential uh, difference when I discuss today's capitalism in developed countries, advanced countries like the US, is that we are no longer in a type of Ricardo Marx classical capitalism. Now, in the Ricardo Marx classical capitalism, you have two classes. You have capitalists that are workers. Essentially, all capitalists are richer than all workers, 
and capitalists have only income from capital, and workers have only income from labor. I will come to the definition of that, but let me just show you how that sort of idealized distribution looks in a sort of Ricardo Marx capitalism. You have, as I said, two groups of people. As you can see, everybody who is in a group of capitalists, there may be some distribution because they're richer or poor capitalists, but everybody who is capitalist is richer than everybody who is working. This is one of the reasons, and I often, when I teach my class to my students, I say, one of the reasons why you find very little about interpersonal inequality, which as you already said before, this is something that I've been working for a number of years. You find very little of that in Marx, partly, be, largely, because he, like Ricardo, thought in terms of classes, and he thought in terms of the functional distribution of income. So for him, what was irrelevant was how much of the total income goes to capitalists, how much to workers, because there were no really very, uh, cases of capitalists who would also double as wage workers or workers who would be capitalists. So that's why functional income distribution had been much more studied. And ironically, it was somebody from the right, like Wilfredo Pareto, who was the first to empirically study interpersonal inequality. So we are kind of a, in a bizarre situation. People generally are on the left. People who are on the left tend to actually choose the topic of income inequality. But you know, we can find very little about interpersonal income inequality in Marx, but we find quite a lot of that in Pareto. So that's kind of a little bit of the irony of the situation. So a different way to see the income distribution in classical capitalism is to say or to have it as on this graph, where on the horizontal axis you rank people by their income level. And then on the vertical axis, you see their income. So as you can see, actually, I mean, on that very simplified you know, drawing, you see actually individuals are sort of, they are still workers, but they are like richer workers and poorer workers. But then, lab, I mean, capital income belongs to capitalists. And of course, it is, I put it in a different shape because of, of, we generally tend to believe that income from capital is distributed more unevenly than income from labor. And we'll see that in a minute, that actually that's the case. So I put it like as an exponential function rather than <coughs> a linear function like with, uh, with uh, labor. Now, what is uh, now the difference between that idealized type, ideotypical type in, in Max Weber's terminology, capitalism and our today's capitalism, or new capitalism, or meritocratic capitalism? labor capitalism, is that today we actually have basically many more people receiving incomes, both from capital and labor. Now, that does not mean that they actually receive equal amounts, and it does not mean they receive equal shares. Capitalists, of course, receive much more, I mean, people who are richer receive greater share of their total income from ownership than people who are poor. But the difference with, uh, from the classical capitalism is that they now don't, you don't have that sharp demarcation between capitalists and workers in the sense that 100% of income of capitalism is only from property and zero from wages. You will say in a minute that it would actually play a very big role in what I'm going to argue and to speak. The empirical thing is that as I said, <coughs> that you, as you move up in the income distribution, in meritocratic capitalism, you have more of the total income received by, uh, by uh, uh, more of the total income coming from property. So here is a graph, again the same, you assume labor income going up, actually there are uh, more uh, richer workers, less rich workers, and so on. Now what happens with their uh, income blue line is the income from capital. Most of them don't have any income from capital. But then you start actually having an income from capital, and people who are in this sort of part of the, of the graph, they actually, as you can see, if you draw a vertical line over there before the, the I mean, after the zero point, where actually everybody has zero capital income, <laughs> after that point, you have people who have both capital and labor. And the more you go towards richer groups, the more they have the bulk of their income coming from capital. So essentially, you still have richest people relying on income from property, but they do now have also some income from labor. As I said, this is going to play a big role in what I'm going empirically to show you, and I had to invent a name for that, 
uh, because we now have more and more people who are very rich and who have both large incomes from labor and large income from capital. So imagine like a big heads of the enterprises or owners of enterprises who also own that enterprise and they actually, all, uh, in some cases, they, they have obviously shares in other enterprises or they are CEOs of large enterprises who have saved quite a lot of money from high salaries and then invested. So what you have, what you have then, you have really people who have income both from capital and labor. And so the new term which I invented for that is obviously you have to go to Greek in order to invent a new term. So I called it homo plutia. A homo obviously from the same, plutia from wealth. So you would actually have people who would be both wealthy in, in the space of labor income and in the space of capital income. I mean, that's something totally new and I will show you more when I actually come, oh, sorry, that I didn't bring capital income. Uh, it's the blue line. Uh, I will show you that more in, in a minute empirically how things look like. So now, what is the, uh, why is the fact that people who are richer and who have a more greater share of their income from capital, why is it a problem? The problem comes from the following. We know empirically that in the last 30 years, rich countries have had an increasing share of national income received by capital and not more than in, than in the past. So in other words, the capital share has been going up. If the capital share goes up, but let's suppose all of us have the same amount of capital or the same amount of property, then there is no problem because we would all get the same increase from that rise in capital share. So imagine you have automation, robotics, labor has become less important, people who actually own this machines that produce robots and others become rich, but we all have the same amount. So in that case, it is not an issue for interpersonal income inequality. The rising capital share really would have no effect on rising income inequality. Actually, it would even have a negative effect for reduced inequality because labor is not equally distributed, but capital is. But obviously that's not the society that we live in. So that would be what I call egalitarian capitalism, where actually everybody would have the same uh, 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 amount of capital. <coughs> but what's the next one? The next one is, with, suppose that we all have different incomes, like as we have them now, but that the composition of our incomes is the same. So you can be 10 times richer than I, but your composition would be 30% income from capital, 70% income from labor. My composition, similarly, 30% from capital, 70% from labor. Now, what happens then when you have the increase in capital share in national accounts? Well, there is no change in inequality because the percentage increase in income which we both receive is the same. Obviously, you have 10 times as much as I do, but you would receive more, like 10 times more in absolute amount. But percentage-wise, the ratio between you and me would not change. We have that system at all. So this is something that I call people's capitalism. So that would be a capitalism where the shares would be the same, but incomes would not be the same. Incomes would be, would be actually quite unequal, as unequal as they are today. Well, the problem is that we live in a sort of a capitalism that has a sort of regularity that richer people have larger share of their total income received from ownership. When this is the case, an increasing share of capital in national income or in GDP automatically translates in rising interpersonal inequality. I'm going to say that a few more times because it's absolutely crucial thing to understand. The link between the rising share of in the capital, I mean, uh, functional distribution of income, where capital becomes more important, and how that leads quasi-automatically into a transmission into higher interpersonal inequality. And the reason why it happens is because, as I said before, capital is percentage-wise received more by the rich people, and the Gini coefficient, which means, which goes together with what I just said, the Gini coefficient of capital is much higher than the Gini coefficient of labor. Just to give you an idea, and I will see the numbers in a minute, the Gini coefficient of capital income 
is in all <coughs> advanced countries between 0.85 and 0.95. You know that the Gini maximum is one, which is an extreme case where the entire income would receive by one individual. So obviously we are not there yet, but we are not that far from it. All rich countries have Gini's that are, as I said, between 8, 0.85 and 0.95. Well, the Gini of labor income is typically, before taxation, is typically around 0.4 to 0.5. So what then happens with the rising capital share is that you have, as I said before, you have the rising inequality in, in actual you know, disposable income. So this is really with the motivation of lots of things that I actually wanted to, to show you. So here is what I said before, the difference in the genius of capital and labor. This is the examples of the US and the UK. This is based on Luxembourg income study data. I work with them. And, these are the micro data, which are actually based on household surveys, and then it is uh, so-called listified, which means they are actually, uh, uh, in principle, <coughs> the definitions of the variables are the same. Now, you notice on that there are interesting things. Like if you look at the UK data, you notice labor income, which is red, has really gone up in inequality quite substantially since Margaret Thatcher, and has remained at that level. But the blue line, which shows you the Gini coefficient of capital, has remained at a very, very high level. It's very difficult for that blue line to go higher up simply because, you know, you're limited by the number of, you know, total inequality cannot go over, so Gini cannot go over one, but as you can see, it is very high, it's around point now. So this is what actually is the problem. The problem is that when rich countries become more capital intensive, particularly if it happens so with robotics and other things, you would actually have transmission of inequality into very quick transmission into interpersonal inequality. So this is essentially, as I said, the, the, uh, the idea behind that, that um, uh, uh, sort of introduction or behind the study of, of liberal capitalism. And uh, this is something that I already mentioned, so I will skip that very quick, I will go over that very quickly. It is simply the, the situation that I sort of mentioned before of people's capitalism, where we would all we would have different incomes, and our ratio in incomes would be maybe again 10 to 1, but we would have the share both from capital and labor the same. As you notice here, actually these individuals who are ranked on the horizontal axis, they have both capital and labor, and they their their uh, capital and labor increase in the same proportion. So again, if you're twice as rich as I am, you're going to have twice as much, twice as much as uh, of capital as uh, of labor than I do. And in that case, what is happening is that in that case of people capitalism, what is interesting is the Gini coefficient of labor income becomes the same as the Gini coefficient of capitalism. And this is the crucial part because if the two, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> if the two genies uh, become the same then the rising share of capital income does not Im immediately mean uh, the increase in inequality between individuals. So, uh, for comparative purposes, how would socialism look like? Socialism would like with the red light the same labor income distribution, let's suppose as we had before, but capital income would be distributed equally in amount. <coughs> So this is what I called before when I was introducing that, like egalitarian, you know, capitalism where you actually would have uh, capital income being the same across everybody. So as you notice here, the share actually in this case, is, in this case declines with level of income. Because people who are at the top there, they have the same amount of capital income as I do, but they have much higher total income, so the share of capital income. Now, let me then go into the, this is basically the summary of what I said, so I will skip this. Let me then go and show you the, how it looks in, in real life, <coughs> how we can actually see some of these phenomena, <coughs> excuse me, that I have sort of simply sketched, how they look in real life. And I will talk, if we have the time, I will talk also, well, we might not have time, about the social effects and uh, the policies. So there are six, what I call six systemic inequalities in liberal capitalism. One, I already mentioned that increasing aggregate share of capital in national income. Secondly, high concentration of capital ownership, which is also something that I already mentioned. 
And then I will also, another important factor which is actually not studied very much is that the, the, the people who have higher amounts of capital tend to actually receive a higher rate of return on that capital. It's a very interesting topic that I think actually many students uh, are beginning now to study because that was something that was not very much studied. Then the next one is homophobia that I mentioned. The interesting topic is homogamy, which is essentially people marrying each other who are of the same income group or education level, which of course adds to inequality. And then of course high control <coughs> of the political process by the rich, and finally transmission of that inequality across generations. So let me show you then the, the numbers. This is from of course other people's work, this one. And there are many people who have actually sort of now documented the rising share of capital in total income. So this is my number one, and it's actually the one that motivates lots of the discussion that follows. The second one is one that I actually already sh have shown you, uh, but here with a few more countries, I've got now about 20 countries. You see basically in all countries, including Slovenia, I have numbers also from Slovenia, you have the blue line, which is the Gini coefficient of capital income being substantially twice, approximately twice as high as the uh, Gini coefficient of labor. Uh, this is yet another, the same story, but now uh, shown differently with uh, Gini's of labor and capital on two different axes. A country which is interesting there, you might wonder which is this country, uh, TWN, that's Taiwan. It's an interesting country because although it has high inequality, <clears throat> on uh, of labor income, still you know about 80, it has significantly lower inequality of labor income of capital income than other rich countries. Uh, there are some historical reasons for that. I will skip them, but uh, you know that has been sort of explained in the literature. But it's very kind of interesting to just keep it in mind. Notice also Korea actually having uh, inequality of labor income which is relatively small compared to the uh, rich uh, Western countries. Now, the second thing is the high rate of return on the assets of the rich. As I said before, I think it's an extremely interesting <coughs> topic. And that high rate of return comes from, two, I'm not going to go into all these details, and this graph is a little bit complicated, it is from Ed Wolf's book, but basically there are two reasons why the rich have higher return of return on their assets than people who actually have, who are less rich in terms of property or assets. The, re the first reason is that, uh, uh, the rich people tend to have financial assets, whereas the middle class in, in advanced countries essentially has only housing. And 30% of the population have not. So essentially the distribution, if you look at Germany, if you look at the UK, and if you look at the US, is as follows. The 30% of the bottom have zero or negative uh, net assets. Then from the 30th percentile to the 95th percentile, essentially your assets are housing, and the top 5% your assets are predominantly financial assets. There is a compositional difference between the, the, them, as you can see. So when uh, the return on assets or stock markets uh, is higher than the return on housing, the rich obviously gain more because their assets are mostly financial assets. But they, interesting, and that's the topic, as I said, was not very much research. Uh, that's also from a relatively new paper, or, or actually quite new paper by Eric Smith. <coughs> they do seem to have even a higher return on the financial assets than the other people. The reason is that the access, uh, their access costs. So you cannot go and have an advice from banks, uh, you know, Credit Suisse or uh, Union de Banque de Suisse or something, if you show up there with 500 euros. So obviously if, if you have legal money, you will have to actually figure yourself where to invest and how to invest. But when you have lots of money, instead of 500 euros, you show up with 5 million euros, then of course they would give you a good advice. They would actually give you managers who would guarantee a rate of return of X percent, and then everything else they would take, obviously, as a management fee. So in other words, you are actually uh, likely to have a higher rate of return if you're richer. So that, as I said, is a empirical a topic, not much research, but it's very important for exacerbation or increase in an economy. Then let me come to homophobia, which I already mentioned. This is the data from the US going back to the 19, uh, what was the first year, 1980, from the <coughs> current population survey. That's actually a survey that collects every year data on income distribution. And that line, red line here, 
shows the rising share of people who are both the top decile by labor income and the top decile by capital income. That's with, I mean, if you remember what I said in the beginning when I spoke of classical capitalism, that would never happen in classical capitalism because in classical capitalism, the rich people will not have labor income. But what was interesting in new capitalism is that you have increasing number of people who have large salaries and also large income from profit. Uh, what is interesting is that when you look at the, again from the list uh, of Luxembourg income survey data, when you look at individual countries, you find differences, but you find essentially about 20% of the people to be, to be both capital rich and labor rich. And think what would happen if you had, if this graph in the US were to keep on going and then you have 100%. That would mean <coughs> that whoever is in the top decile by labor income is also going to be in the top decile by capital income. Essentially, that makes the struggle against inequality very difficult because you can be from the ethical or moralistic point of view, you can say in the past, these really rich capitalists, we should really take money from them, we should, you know, have high inheritance tax, we should have high tax on capital and so on, because they also don't work. But if they do work, and actually we empirically know that people with higher salaries actually tend to even work longer hours than people with lower salaries. Your ethical case for high taxation becomes much weaker, and it's actually not very clear that you should actually tax them so severely, because they are both workers, laborers, and capitalists. Now notice the countries that actually have a small share of these two, of the, of these two groups, uh, I mean, being like both capital uh, rich and labor rich, are countries like Mexico and Brazil, which are still at a relatively earlier stage of development of liberal capitalism compared to the countries like the US, Italy, I think Italy is here actually the highest, Netherlands, Ireland, and so forth. So essentially the more developed countries, and Italy is actually a very interesting example, with very large percentage of people who are both capital rich and labor rich. Uh, now this is something that my students, number four is called Logam, and my students always love this graph because they find it extremely useful in their decision making. And that graph shows, for the US case, shows the percentage of the young American males, in those days these are the cohorts, these are people in 1970 who were of the age between 20 and 35, so for men, and they were all in the top uh, bracket by, <coughs> by labor income. So basically I take everybody who is of that age, who is male, and who is in top labor income bracket in 1970. And these are people who are then of age 20 to 35. And I say, how many of them marry women who are also of the same age but who are in the top labor income bracket for women and how many of them marry women who are at the bottom income bracket for women? That, the, the, if you go in 19, 1970, you see these red and blue lines actually crossing each other, meaning that the likelihood, let's suppose I'm a young man in 1970, actually I was a young man. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, it was not in the top of the income bracket. Uh, but what is my likelihood of marrying a woman from the top income bracket versus the bottom income bracket? It was percentage-wise one-to-one, because these two numbers, as you can see, intersect. What is it now, when I'm no longer young man? It's like three-to-one. Actually, men tend now three times more likely to marry women from the top income bracket than women from the bottom income bracket. And this is what homologam means. It's actually much greater likelihood of people with the same education level and income level partnering. Uh, this is a big topic, and uh, actually, we, I'm sure that everybody would have their own idea because it's linked to the greater labor force participation of women, emancipation of women, uh, postponement of the, of the time of marriage, and all that. But I'm just showing you simply numbers because these numbers have an influence on inequality. If you have uh, uh, men and women of the same income level marrying each other, that would actually push very clearly inequality up. If you have the situation of men and women of different income level marrying or partnering, that would be much less of an that would have much less of an impact on inequality. 
Now, so not to be seen to be actually sort of only showing the numbers that to be politically correct, politically correct, I show the same numbers now from the point of view of women. And they're even more dramatic. <laughs> actually, in the US, the likelihood of, you know, of uh, rich women marrying uh, poor men has gone from it being one to one to has gone now to one against five. In other words, they are five times more likely to marry somebody who is rich from the top income group than somebody who is from the bottom income group. And that percentage, as you can see here, was one to one. So basically, uh, when you look at from the men's side or women's side, you have had a marked sort of change in the likelihood of, uh, of marriage. The final sort of the final two points here would be, well, they definitely have to be final two, uh, uh, would be the transmission of these advantages. The transmission of what they call time to know, the transmission of advantages that this new upper class uh, with a question mark, sustainable upper class. Uh, if you actually create by all these factors that I mentioned, homo plutia, homogamy, high return of your assets and all that, if you create a top class, is this class going to be sustainable or to remain or not? It can remain only, and I think this is why it's really important to actually to look at politics now, is if you actually have political uh, system working in your face, which means that you dictate the political agenda on taxation, deregulation, any other rules that actually so fulfill your desire. Now, this is from empirical work from the political scientists, and this is a graph which is not important now to understand the details because it's a little bit complicated graph, but the graph simply tends to show the following, that the topics which the rich people care about <coughs> are <coughs> much more likely, that's why the line is going upwards, much more likely to be debated and to be acted and to be voted in national parliaments, in this case in the US it was actually House of Representatives, than the topics that the poor people care. So the rich people would care about safety, about education, about uh, uh, inheritance taxation being low, about taxes being low. The poor people might care about <coughs> crime, uh, uh, immigration, heroin, or whatever, and these topics would tend to be less important or actually less likely to become sort of regulated or voted upon <coughs> than the topics for which are important for the rich. Similar work was done for Germany, and I think that basically then shows you how the rich, of course, empirically we can see how the rich are becoming more important <coughs> in setting the, the policy agenda. And the, the last one is the, is the uh, one that I actually just mentioned in the beginning, was the transmission of these advantages across generations, which I think plays an extremely important role and where the educational system, particularly in the US, but increasingly I think so in Europe with the rise of private schools, with the fact that tuition has gone up in price, mean that essentially people who come from more modest backgrounds are disqualified or it makes, them, makes it very difficult for them to go to actually study and to particularly study in top universities which then themselves guarantee high rate of return on that investment or actually guarantee very high wage. So that was the, the logic of the argument. As you can see, and I will not, I will already go over my time, I will not go now into the policy recommendations, but I think you can implicitly see that the policy recommendations are really of two kinds. One, which will go about, which would address inequality in capital income, and that can be really addressed, I think, most effectively by either high tax rates on capital or inheritance taxation, which in my opinion is even better. So really the importance of uh, not allowing intergenerational, easy intergenerational transmission of large capital advantages. The second type of recommendations would go for the education or for labor, which means that the argument there is that the importance of public education, accessible education, and education of high quality available or accessible to all is absolutely crucial. Because if you don't do these two things, and I think actually we don't see much evidence that anybody is likely to do much about them, but if you don't actually tax inheritance, and if you don't 
uh, reduce the cost of education. You would basically have the same group of people and their children and their offspring gener uh, uh, remaining or maintaining that upper class status. So that would be actually, in that case, we would have a, a, a formation of a new class structure under the <coughs> liberal or new capitalism. So this is actually the, the, my, uh, my uh, policy recommendations come from the sort of the analysis, from the data that I have actually shown you here. So they don't come out just sort of extraneous. And then also I have my last point here, is that they also have to be seen as not corresponding to the typical package of advice that people are giving, which I think is sometimes is based on the wrong idea that we can, in a new economy, bring back the 1960s or the 1970s. Many people of my age of, 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 who have uh, you know, grown up when, you know, the, what the French call the grand glorieuse, and remember how good it was, they believe that actually that increasing transfers, increasing taxation on current income, uh, right, I mean, increasing role of the trade unions um, and increasing education are the four uh, tools that have been very effective in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, all the way to Margaret Thatcher and, and Ronald Reagan, but they can be now brought back. And I think that for various reasons they cannot be brought back, including the very changed nature of work, that we don't work anymore with large, in large uh, companies with uh, homogeneous labor force, that trade unions have, uh, have been on the decline, that actually the only place that have not been in a very severe decline is really in uh, trade unions who work in the state sector, which is really education and health in particular, which is another ironic development because the trade unions were originally formed to, to fight private employee, employers and capitalists, but they actually have become very sort of, uh, of very small importance there, even in countries like France, which now is going on for like one month of strikes, but the share of labor force in private sector, of trade unions in labor, uh, organized trade unions in private sector in France is small. Uh, so that was actually the difference. Uh, in other words, what I actually argue is that we should focus on endowments, on capital and labor being much more equally distributed than they are now, and not on taxation of current income. So in other words, if you want to achieve lower inequality, you have two different uh, roads that you can take. One route is you can tax current income, and leave endowments of capital and labor unchanged, and then you basically distribute that money. Or the other one, if you cannot really go for the distribution of current income because people don't want to be taxed anymore, or they don't want to be taxed more than they are now, then the real solution is making endowments of capital and labor more equal. And this is why the, 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 the recommendation, the idea is, as I said before, is taxation of inheritance or taxation of capital in general, but especially through inheritance tax and uh, uh, access to <coughs> private, to high, I'm sorry, access to <coughs> high level public education that should in terms of quality actually be, be better than, uh, than private, because it's only if you're better you can guarantee the people who go there would then later also get higher salaries. So that would be all, and I would like, of course, I'm so I have to apologize for going over my time, um, but, um, you know, I've done it before, and unfortunately, <laughs> I, I seem to be, to, be, to be redoing it every time.